Hello again. Now we're going to continue our uh, discussion about the discipleship of the Apostle Peter from where we left off in the previous video. Uh, for this talk, we're going to start in, uh, in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, we'll begin with... Uh, verse uh, 17 and he says uh, flesh and blood has not revealed it to you but my father which is in heaven so it's by the spirit that you realize this not by your mind or by flesh and blood um, and I sit and then in verse 18 he says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. What does that mean? Well, Peter means stone. You are a stone, and upon this rock I will build my church. Some people will say that Peter means rock, and he's using the same word, that you are a rock, and upon this rock. But it's really he's using the feminine and the masculine aspects of the word. But we don't need to dig into it that deeply. What we, all we need to do to see what does he mean by upon this rock I will build my church. So we've already done a study in, in episode 25 part 3 about the rock and about the stone of stumbling, and about the building of the church. Uh, we'll just take a quick look here, back at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4. This is what Peter himself is saying. To whom coming, as to a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believes in him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But to them which dis are disobedient, the stone the builders reject rejected, the same is made the head cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So, he's describing the church right here 
built upon the foundation stone, and the foundation stone is Jesus Christ. And it's a spiritual thing. It's, it's believing in Christ. Okay? So, and, and the Apostle Paul also spoke of the same concept. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 to 22, you will hear Paul describe the exact same concept. Jesus Christ is the foundation stone. All the believers are stones built upon him as the chief cornerstone to build a habitation for God to dwell in, which is a spiritual building made up of human believers. So this is what Jesus is referring to when we look at uh, this verse. Uh, we have to think of this, that God is the rock. Jesus is the foundation stone. And he's saying, For flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven by the Spirit. And I say to you that you are Peter, a stone, and upon this rock, the foundation stone, I will build my church. I, he's saying, Jesus is saying, I will build my church. He's not saying, Peter, you will build my church. He's saying, I will build my church. And he is the foundation stone. Okay? And he, and then he also says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what does that mean? Well, in here, the word hell, the King James uh, Bible, and a lot of other Bibles, they, they, trans, they will translate a few different words into the word hell. Hell in um, medieval Europe, was uh, the word the the word in ancient times of, for the English I suppose Anglo-Saxon was a a pit where they would bury their potatoes or something like that. Um, the uh, during the medieval Christian times of Europe, hell became the the place of torment and the devil rules and its fire and the, the devil with the tail and the pitchfork and that kind of stuff. But in ancient times, in this time, with the Greeks, hell, uh, the word here used for hell is Hades. And it simply means the underworld. It's the place of the dead, H Hades. It's, uh, th there was like, you know, you cross the river Styx to get to Hades. And it was not necessarily always a place of torment it was a just a place of the dead there was good parts of it and bad parts of it um, in uh, Hebrew the Hebrew um, construct it's called Shoal which is the same thing it's a place of the dead it's it's where the dead are it's sort of a mystery just like it is to us it's, it's the underworld. It's where the dead go. And that's all the name implies, really. Now, Jesus also spoke of a place called Gehenna, which was a valley in Jerusalem. It's where the, um, the kings of Judah would sacrifice their children to Molech, um, a, fault, a fake god, um, that God um, pronounced um, some very dire prophecies on that place. And that place, um, there are legends that it became a place of burning and where they put their garbage and the dead bodies to burn. Um, that's from uh, also from medieval Jewish thought. Um, Actually, what the archaeologists have found is it was a place of burial and a place of crem cremation burials. And um, 
the, 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 is mainly directed back towards the prophecy. And, and Jesus, he said, Gena, the place where God is able to destroy both soul and body in Gena. It's a place of fire and destruction. So there's Hades, which is simply the underworld, and Gana is a place where both body and soul are destroyed. So in here, he's using the word Hades. That, so he's basically saying, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. Well, what are the gates of Hades? It's dying, going to the underworld through the gates. And he's saying it shall not prevail against it. So belief in Jesus and in his crucifixion and resurrection is key to building the church. And the gates of death will not win, is what he's saying, against the church. Uh, because the church is based on the belief in the resurrection. So this is what he's alluding to here now. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you shall bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, so what does this go, uh, talk about? Binding and loosing. In rabbinic Judaism, binding and loosing are very important terms. Um, they are judicial terms. If a person is found not guilty, and then he is loosed, he is made free. If he is found guilty, then he is bound. And then he is bound by a punishment, uh, whatever that punishment may be. He is bound by that until he is freed. So this is where, um, to a Jew, this is what the idea of binding and loosing would come to mean. And that's very important to understand. So, um, so I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the keys of the kingdom, so you can lock and unlock, and you can bind and loose. So let's find a few examples here of binding and loosing to see what this is about. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. Okay, this is when Jesus is explaining the obligation of the disciples to each other, right? If your brother, we'll go back to verse 15. Um, we'll get back into this later. If your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he shall hear you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglects to hear the church, let him be to you a, as a heathen and a publican, as an unbeliever. Truly I say to you, who, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, again, that's meaning, okay, another way of putting it is, if two of you agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's what binding, the, that's who has the keys of heaven is the believers. And it's not like one believer can just go, oh, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven. Like, you've seen them do this. It's ridiculous. Um, it's where there are true believers 
who are on the path and who are being led by the Holy Spirit, they come together, two or three agree, then, and they agree that this should happen to this person. And it's usually punishment is meted out as a way of leading that person to repentance, not a way of getting vengeance or, or things like that. So this is the binding and loosing that can happen. And if it is done properly and in a proper context, it is heard in heaven and done. And don't think God's just going to go with these willy-nilly um, you know, people talking crap. Um, it doesn't work. It's not going to work that way. But in a serious manner, it that's the way it works. So that's binding and loosing. Let's take a uh, let's look at another example. John chapter twenty, nineteen to twenty three. <clears throat> Jesus appears to the disciples. So this is um, after his resurrection, and he appears to the disciples who are gathered in a room. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. And when he said so, he showed to them his hands and his sides. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. So out of his breath, he breathed it on, onto them. And he said, whatever sins you remit, they are remitted to them. And whatever sins you retain, they are retained. So this is again, the binding and loosing abilities of the church. Uh, wherever two or three agree, two or three who are led by the Holy Spirit, they can bind and loose and forgive and not forgive. Um, and, and, and the main goal is to protect the church and to lead people to repentance. It's not for vengeance or things like that. And people who are led by the Holy Spirit understand that. So. And who are they? Are we going to point them out? It's that guy. It's that guy. It's not, it doesn't work that way. God knows who they are. God will accept or reject those things, depending on who's doing it and why. It, it still go, comes back to God. On, he's still the one who does it or doesn't do it. So that's that. And, and now... We'll move ahead a little bit from Matthew, this, uh, what we just read about the, um, and I will give to you the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forward, Jesus began to show to his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be. This will not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you do not savor the things of God, 
but the things of men. So here, Peter just lost whatever standing he had by denying the death and resurrection of Christ. This is, this is how important this is. And this again goes back to um, typical Hebrew thought patterns. Is, um, you will find in the Hebrew scriptures very often that there's always a contrast. Or there's always a parallel. They'll show you one side of the coin and then the other side of the coin. One side of the parable, the other side of the parable. And this is very typical. Um, so here we are. Because Hebrew thought very much comes from God. He led them for so many centuries. They, they, they um, become like, like him in the, in the thinking patterns. So this is very, very typical of that. So now Peter's one minute building the church and the next minute he's Satan tearing down the church. And what changed? In the first time he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then in the second time he's saying, you will not be crucified. So it comes to the belief in the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And anyone who denies the death and resurrection of Christ is antichrist. It's plain and simple. That is a key right there. If anyone denies the death and resurrection of Christ, they are antichrist. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, that this is the devil, we must kill him. It, it means... When you're looking at teachers, if someone's teaching that, that's not a good teacher. Okay? Um, the, we, we are to, you know, perhaps confront the person in debate, debate-wise, um, but definitely not follow their teaching. Okay? So, then, after he said that, get behind me, Satan, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, for whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is it profited a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So even some of the disciples are not saved. Now, that doesn't specifically mean Peter. It means there are some of them who are not saved. It, so that's that. Now we're going to look at another part that I think is very much related. Who is the greatest? Matthew chapter 18. Okay, so we're going to, what are we skipping here? Well, we're skipping the transfiguration, but we'll do that in the next video. Right now, I think along with the uh, upon this rock thing, we should look at who is the greatest, because it's very much related. At the same time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And... Jesus called the little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, except you are converted and become as a little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, 
this is um, talking about children and it's also talking about new believers if it were better it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea woe unto the world because of offenses for it must need that offenses come but woe to that man by whom the offense comes Matthew chapter 20 verse 20 then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children that's James and John's mother with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him and he said to her what do you want and she said grant that these my two sons may sit one on your right side and the other on your left in your kingdom and Jesus answered and said you don't know what you're asking are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with and they said we are able with their mother standing there and he said to them you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father because this is the government in heaven okay so yeah um, and being baptized and drinking his cup is um, they probably died for their faith okay <laughs> and when the ten heard it this was two of the disciples James and John when the other ten heard it they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. And Jesus called to them and they said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. This again comes back to the church. Among you, the believers, you are the church. Don't do it that way, like the Gentiles. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So, um, that is speaking about... Um, nobody's the chief and that gives orders from on high um, everybody is there as a servant of each other and that is the way the the true church of christ works it's a spiritual uh, union and that is what it's based on it's based on ministering to each other Mark chapter 9 verse 33 and he came to Capernaum and being in the house he asked them what was it that you disputed among yourselves along the way and they held their peace they must have been all mad at each other and he's saying what are you arguing about and they held their peace for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and he called the twelve and he said to them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be the last of all and the servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever shall receive one of such children in my name receives me, and whoever shall receive me receives not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, remember James and John and their mother? John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he doesn't follow us, and we forbade him because he doesn't follow us. And Jesus said, 
Do not forbid him, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me, for he that is not against us is on our part. So there's another church doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, there's lots of them. There's thousands of them. Leave them alone. Uh, Jesus knows who's in the church and who isn't. So, um, whoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. And whoever shall offend one of your little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. So that ends this video. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.